Don Terwilliger listened to Willie and tapped out the tune of an old song on the steering wheel of his truck as he drove down the main street of Wilson's Mill. It was hot, dry, and dreary outside, but he kept the window of his old truck open as he drove. Sweat ran down his face, and dust from the road coated his once white T-shirt. His hands were smeared with machine oil, as were his shirt and dirty jeans. By all rights, he should have been angry and upset, but for some reason, he just wasn't. This was out of character. Don took in everything life threw at him and grinned. He rolled from the blows, bowed his head, and continued to advance. He was driving through town on his way to the John Deere dealership 37 miles away to pick up a part for his old combine. Most farmers would be so angry that they would shake and scream over the breakdown. Don was upset, but accepted what fate had given him. After all, he was alive and had a wonderful wife who worked alongside him and helped him raise his two children. What more could a man want than this? Enough food, a place to live, and good friends? No, life was good, sometimes harsh, but good. He had everything he needed. Don was almost out of town when he frowned and turned his head. Randy's truck was parked in front of a local bar. If it were evening, especially Friday or Saturday evening, there would be nothing strange about it, even now, at the beginning of the harvest season. It was strange that he was there at noon and parked with one front wheel on the sidewalk. No, it was something strange and required some investigation. Don knew that Randy and Shirley were in a difficult situation at that moment. He didn't know the whole story, but the rumors swirling around made it clear that Randy was more than a little upset with Shirley, and with good reason. Don pulled his truck over and pulled into the Wilson's Mill parking lot to turn around. He quickly returned to the bar and parked his truck next to Randy's. Don walked into the bar and paused to let his eyes adjust to the darkness inside. He saw Dottie sitting on her stool behind the bar, looking to see who came in when the door opened. Randy didn't even turn his head. He just sat in the back booth and stared into space, almost glaring at the small wall of honor. There were already four empty bottles on the table. Randy almost finished his fifth. Before Dottie could ask, Don walked up to the bar and said, Dos equis lager, please, Dottie. He nodded his head towards Randy and asked, Do you know what this all means? No. It burst in here boiling about 30 minutes ago and has been devouring them very quickly ever since. He had already drunk before he got here. I'm going to interrupt him, Don. He hasn't said a word, just tells me when he wants more. Judging by the expression on his face, whatever it is, it's definitely not good. Don took his beer and walked over to Randy's table. He sat down without asking permission and watched Randy for a while. Neither man said a word. Randy finished his beer and looked toward the bar, picking up the empty bottle and shaking it back and forth. Dottie frowned and hesitated. Then, with a sigh, she pulled out another one, opened it, and handed it to him. She said, This is the last one, Randy. You had a few before you came, and now this will be your sixth bottle here in less than an hour. I think you better give me your keys now, too, son. Randy took the beer and glared at Dottie. He turned his head, tipped back the bottle, and took a long sip of the still cold beer. His face turned back to the wall and her photographs, while his hands tightened their grip on the beer bottle. His jaw was clenched in anger as his gaze glared at the picture. Don turned his head to see what Randy was staring at. He seemed to be looking at a photograph of Don and himself with Stuart Pauls, Mona Graber, Wilson Anderson, and some of the other men and women of their security company while they were in the sandbox during Desert Storm almost 16 years ago. For the life of him, he couldn't understand why Randy was looking at the photo with such anger. Finally, Don said, You want to talk about it, buddy? Randy looked away and looked at Don for the first time. His brow furrowed and his lips pursed. You know, he asked, How long has she been doing this? Don frowned, took another look at the photos and replied, What do you do, buddy? Randy gave a short, strangled laugh and replied, That's right. You tell me that you are the only one who didn't know except me. This is all? Heck, even Dottie knows, don't you, Dottie? Don looked up at the surprised Dottie. She frowned and shrugged, then shook her head. Randy yelled, Bullshit! They were here, I know, isn't it? 
What fucking friends you all turned out to be. I thought we were like in a movie. You know, a band of brothers. You know, bros before girls at night. Crap. Come on, Randy, Don said. Dude, we've been close since high school, but I have absolutely no idea what the hell you're talking about right now. Come on, at least give me a hint. Randy stared at Don for a moment. Don could almost see the gears turning in Randy's brain. Finally, he said, Well, maybe you don't know. Ever since you married Mona, you haven't been here that often. But damn, you still come to this coffee shop often. Didn't Mona say anything? Don thought he knew why Randy was in this state right now and said, Well, yeah, but... Randy jumped to his feet and tried to punch Don. Don jumped back and dodged the blow. He was glad that the table they were sitting at had booths along the wall and chairs with their backs to the room. If there had been a full house, Randy would have probably punched him. Whatever the case, Don nearly lost his balance when his legs became entangled in a falling chair. Luckily, when Randy lunged and struck, he was so drunk that he lost his balance. Don was the first to regain his balance and hugged Randy, pinning his arms to his sides so Randy wouldn't hit him. Having done this, he said, Hey, son, I don't know what crawled up your ass, but you asked, now let me finish. Like I said, yes, we all know you and Shirley have been fighting for the last few months. Damn, I heard some things she told you, and if Mona talked to me like that, we'd be going around in circles, but that's all I know, and I think that's all Mona knows, too. That's no reason to try and hit me, though. Damn it, we're friends. Randy struggled a moment longer, then relaxed. To Don's embarrassment, Randy collapsed back into his seat and began to cry. Don looked at Dottie and shook his head. He thought, damn, all we need now is a fucking crying drunk. He looked at his watch. It took too long. He needed to get to the hardware store before closing, get his part, and return home. Crap. Finally, Don made a decision. He reached into Randy's pocket and pulled out his wallet, then headed toward the bar. How much is it, Dottie? Seven bottles of beer cost $14, as always, Don. You know it. What are you going to do with it? Damn it, I don't know. You don't think I can leave him here, do you? Dottie smiled and shook her head lightly back and forth. Understood. Don pulled $15 out of Randy's wallet, then took one out of his and handed it to Dottie. She looked at the money and said, I said seven bottles of beer, Don. Yes, I heard. Keep it to yourself and keep quiet about it, please, Dottie. I'll take it with me while I get my parts and try to figure out what's going on. Fine. If you can, let me know what's wrong, too. Maybe I can help. It's just not like him at all. Don returned to Randy and helped him up. Come on, Randy, he said. You can go to the city with me while I buy spare parts for the Combine. We'll talk a little on the way. As they pulled onto the road and the tires began to hum... Don looked at Randy. He looked out the window, clenching his jaw tightly. Don said, Now, buddy, why don't you tell me what the hell is going on today? She's fucking bitch and is going to leave me. What? Who is this bitch and is going to leave you? Shirley? Damn, I know you've been at each other's throats for a while now, but what makes you think she's going to leave you? Do you really think that swearing will solve problems? I don't just call her names. It is a fact. She's a fucking slut. These are the facts. I heard her talking to Trickster Willie this morning. She's a real, easy-to-get young woman from real life for this idiot pimp. I was supposed to be planting second crop beans and wheat stubble, but I forgot to oil the cedar, so I went back inside to do it. I was working in the garage when they left the house. The bitch was supposed to leave for town this morning, said she had some bills to pay, and she'd probably be there all day, shopping and everything. You know, she's been running around a lot lately. I couldn't cope with my work at home. The house is a complete mess. Damn it. I don't have any clean clothes and dishes are piled up everywhere. She used to handle the housework and could still help me a little. But now sometimes she doesn't even have a dish ready when I come over to eat. Anyway, Dodger Willie parked his old truck in the lot next to her car, and they were talking as they walked out. I heard him tell her that he had one client for her this morning, and three wanted to see her at noon. I just stood there in shock. I couldn't believe I actually heard it. I looked through the crack in the door and saw her laughing and flirting. She looked worried. She asked how much he charged them and what they all wanted. The asshole told her that in the morning it's just regular sex, but at noon 
It's big money. Everything would be unlimited. Any hole, as many times as they wanted, for two hours for one hundred dollars Damn cheater, she simply stopped and smiled, then extended her hand and said, Money in advance. Willie looked offended and said he would pay, and then asked her if she didn't trust him. She said, Hell no, I don't trust you, you moron. Last time I had one of those unlimited acts, you paid me for a simple check. Now I want my $1,000 up front, or I won't see any of it. You won't deceive me anymore. You know I have to earn enough to get the hell out of here. I can't stand this shit anymore. I'm sick of this damn farm, the dirt, and all that crap. I'm sick of all these fucking farmers. Two years ago, I told him that I was tired of this and wanted to move, but he blew me off. Willie told her that he didn't have any cash with him and would have to pay her later. She looked at him intently for a minute, then said, Okay, fine, but no payment, no sex. Understood? I'll get my share before the action starts, or I won't enter the room, honey. He scolded her and then said, Okay, fine. Now let's get the hell out of here before that idiot comes back or we'll be late. Then they both got into their cars and drove away. Don looked at Randy in shock. Wow, man. Are you sure that's what they said? What did they say when you came face to face with them? Dude, I didn't say call it it. I mean, I was so shocked and they left so quickly that I just stood there in shock. Then I went into the house and had a couple of drinks and then went to Dottie's. You know the rest. The rest of the ride passed in silence as the two men watched the road and lived in their own thoughts. On the way back home, Don finally said, So what now? Are you going to explain yourself to her or what? What the hell are you talking about? The bitch is gone, and Willie will remain in the world of offended men. You should have taken your piece and served it instead of getting drunk. I probably screwed this one up, but yeah. We're going to have a fight. Now a little pain will pass, and I will divorce this bitch as quickly as possible. Both men continued to reflect on the events of the past day as they drove. Don barely slowed down to the speed limit as they passed Wilson's mill. Randy shouted, Hey! You forgot my truck, Don. No, I didn't forget, Randy. You'll come home with me and we'll talk about this some more. I want Mona in this and I think we need Slim, too. Mona? Dude, I don't know. She is quite close to Shirley. I think Slim is fine, but why do you want to involve him? You know that all four of us were locked in the sandbox. Heck, we've been friends since high school. Besides, Mona is smart. She's probably smarter than any of us, and I trust her completely. She won't give you away. After what her sister-in-law did to her brother, she hates traitors with a passion. I never really liked the Dodger, but after we got back, something really went wrong with him. All six of us banded together when we graduated from high school and went through that hell together. We had each other's back. Well, now those of us left still have your back. I have to admit, when we were there and Trickster Willie and Shirley had sex, I thought they were going to get married. We were all surprised when she married you and not him. I could never understand why, really. Well, I guess I was stupid. Do you know me? Willie and Shirley served in the same platoon. We were always together on missions and so on. Well, I also thought that Shirley and Willie were a couple, but I guess that's not the case. Or maybe that's how it was. Damn it, I don't know. I know she slept with him often, of course, but she slept with me, too, and I heard that she was doing this with several others, but I was never able to prove it. Anyway, I spent as much time with her as I could. Damn it, she was a woman and I was lonely like everyone else, and it was damn good sex. And it still is. I thought we were close, but every now and then she and Willie would go away, and sometimes after that I would see her with someone else. Anyway, after Willie's dad died and he came home early, Shirley and I were kind of together all the time. As we were going through the checkup before returning home, Shirley came up to me and told me she was pregnant. She claimed that I was the only one she had been with since Willie came home and the baby was mine. You know, we got married as soon as we could after we got home, and then a couple of months later she started having seizures and so on. She told me that she had lost the child. Damn it, I don't know. We had a few rough patches over the years and she never got pregnant again. About every time old Willie was back in town for a long time, Shirley and I got into trouble. I should have left her years ago, but when things were good, they were really good, you know? 
she maintained a good home and helped a lot in difficult times. Although this time it's even worse. Randy was still drunk when they returned to Don and Mona's house. Instead of doing what he usually did and driving straight to the broken equipment, Don stopped at the house. As Randy followed him inside, Mona entered the kitchen from the sewing room. She saw Randy and smiled, then said, Hi, Randy. Long time no see. You look bad. Everything is fine. Don intervened and said, No, honey. He has some problems. We stopped for tea and then returned to work on the combine. Would you like to come and help someone? We need to talk about something and I can't waste any more daylight. Mona frowned and quickly returned to the sewing room. Coming out of the kitchen, she said, Yes, let me turn off the sewing machine and the light, and I'll come to you now, honey. While the three of them were working on the combine, the men told Mona this story. At one point, Mona said, Damn it, I knew she was a little... Oh, damn. I heard there that she was known to charge for dates, but after you all got married, I thought she settled down. Heck, I've heard rumors that several women supplement their income by spreading their legs. Hell, I even had a few offers. I would try it myself if Don weren't here, although I never wanted to do anything that could quarrel between us. I heard that Dodger Willie was her pimp there, but that was just random snippets of conversation. There were rumors that you wanted to take Shirley after Tricky Willie. Supposedly he went with her as a security guard or something like that. You both know that if things had been too revealing, command would have intervened and the criminal investigations division would have investigated. I just thought it was mostly rumors. So how do you know she's back to her old tricks? Do you have any proof? If you file for divorce, you need to tie this tight or you'll lose your shirt. It sounds like she's at least saving some of her money. Do you know where is it? Even if it's ill-gotten, it's earned in the marriage, and you deserve some of it in the divorce. I don't want you to go crazy here. If you're doing this, you need to do it right. Randy looked at Mona and grinned, then said, Yes, First Sergeant. Whatever you say, First Sergeant. But how am I going to do this right, First Sergeant? Let the First Sergeant shit himself, idiot. You know how I feel about it when we're not on duty. As far as doing things right, you leave that to Don and me. The first thing we have to do is get everything settled for you at home. We don't need her to leave before we're ready if we can help it. Now I'll go inside and call her and tell her that Don found you drunk in town and brought you here. No, I have a better idea. I'll tell her about the broken harvester and that you're helping us fix it. Damn, that's almost logical and should be a good alibi. You're an engine sergeant and a damn good mechanic, so it makes sense that you'd help you can even stay the night and we'll just tell her we worked late and insisted you stay the night if she asks. Maybe we can bring Slim in and do some initial planning here. After Shirley's phone call, the three friends called Slim. He agreed to come and supposedly help them work on the combine. After Slim arrived, against Mona's better judgment, they all grabbed beers and sat around the kitchen table, discussing Randy's problem with Shirley. They decided they needed more help and called in a couple of their security friends. However, they had to be careful, because Shirley was also still in the guard, and they didn't want rumors to get to her. That weekend, the three friends went to a security meeting as usual, but sometimes during the day, they found time to talk quietly and recruit two or three people to help Randy. They only spoke to those they felt they could trust. They didn't talk to anyone they hadn't previously agreed upon to try to get involved in the operation. Slim was still on security duty, but in a different unit that wasn't meeting that weekend. However, he also had a couple of people he would contact in his next exercise. For the most part, the Guard is a small organization, and many people know each other, especially in the upper echelons. Of course, many people in the security unit are local residents, so they also know each other as neighbors. Randy found it almost impossible to stay home with Shirley around, Luckily, this was his busiest part of the year, and he could legitimately spend most of his time away from work. It was also plausible that he ate quickly, talked to her little, went to bed early, got up early, and left the house. He was legitimately tired every night, and because of that and Shirley's attitude, he managed to avoid having sex with her. His first series of tests for sexually transmitted diseases came back negative, 
and he began to breathe easier. He was pretty sure that Shirley used protection most, perhaps all of the time, with her clients because she never brought any illness into his home. The guard was regularly tested for AIDS and other diseases, so his civilian tests were mainly to allay Randy's fears. He really didn't expect to find any illnesses. Ten days after meeting with Don, the friends met to begin detailed planning for their operation. Since she was the first sergeant of their unit, Mona had access to the armory. It helped that Randy was a motor sergeant and Don was a drill sergeant. Mona simply received permission from her commander to meet with some of her sergeants in the armory. At the appointed time, the three old-timers and six of their friends and fellow guardsmen met in the armory, dressed in uniform as if they were doing legitimate work. Neither Shirley nor Willie thought anything unusual was going on. In case anyone decided to check on the conspirators, they did plan something for future training and left some paper notes. This, of course, was also necessary in order for them to be paid for their evening work. The meeting was held in a military manner. They prepared an operational order, brainstormed plans for the operation, and determined the equipment needed for it. Some of the necessary equipment had been provided to them by the guards, and they planned to use it. Of course, they would be using it in an unauthorized manner, but given their rank, position in the unit, and length of service, they were confident that unless it was lost or damaged, they could easily get by with borrowing the equipment. All surveillance will be led by three men whom Slim hired from his military police unit. Two of them actually worked as law enforcement officers in their civilian jobs. One was a deputy sheriff in their county, the other a city policeman. These two men brought additional experience to the operation and even had access to some quality surveillance equipment. The icing on the cake was that if they could get information about Shirley and Tricky Willie, they could use the legally obtained piece of evidence to prosecute them. Assuming they were involved in trafficking their bodies, they might even be able to attract other law enforcement agencies. Thirteen days after their first planning session in the armory room, they were ready to execute their plan. All participants were aware of their role in the operation and prepared to carry out a mission that was, to all intents and purposes, military, regardless of the fact that it was conducted in a civilian location. At the beginning of the operation, as in any military operation, intelligence gathering began. The programs were downloaded to Shirley and Wilson's cell phones. Landline telephones were tapped, and cameras and voice recorders were installed in both homes and vehicles. Players were targeted to identify additional co-conspirators. It took them two weeks to find where Shirley hid her earnings. Unsurprisingly, she did not have a local bank account for this money. A somewhat bigger surprise was that the money was also not deposited in the safe deposit box. She kept the money in a nice safe inside an old garbage disposal parked behind the machine shed. At some point, the safe was welded inside the grain separation area of the combine in front of the straw separator. She actually had to get into the car to gain access to the safe. She used it quite often. There was a fairly well-defined area under the back of the combine where she would climb in and out of the machine to hide her money. After they found the safe, the team installed a high-sensitivity low-light camera in the harvester to get a clear image of the dial so they could identify the combination and collect the money when the operation was complete. On the 20th day of surveillance, Thursday, Mona received a call from Slim, the senior sergeant of surveillance. He said, we have a serious problem here. Terry is going crazy and wants to quit everything. We need a team decision on this issue and probably a hell of a lot more influence than any of us have. What's itching in your ass, Skinny? Calm down. Damn, you sound more excited than when we were bringing the mortars there. Willie and Shirley are working today, you know? We kept an eye on them, and the game here became much more dangerous. They waited in the motel room for their midday clients. After Willie finished receiving his fee, Shirley asked for her share of the day's earnings. He said, Nothing will work out this afternoon, Shirley. It's a freebie, like an insurance policy for us. Shirley just looked at Willie and said, Bullshit. Nobody has this girl for free, and I'm damn sure I'm not going to give four idiots unlimited fucking for free. I'm leaving here. 
Willie grabbed her hand and pulled her back into the room and then onto the bed. He looked really scared and said, Shirley, we have no choice here. Your current clients are the sheriff, the chief of police, and two of their friends. The sheriff or the chief of police, one of them, somehow got wind of us, and the sheriff came to me with a deal. They can own it for free once a month and receive 10% of the proceeds, or we'll go to jail. We have no choice here, Shirley. Well, Terry got really scared when he heard that and wanted to leave, but we talked him into staying until we talked to you. Damn. Now we don't know what to do with it. We have no idea how deeply rotten county or city law enforcement is. Damn it. Who the hell should we get involved with this? Or should we just give up? I mean, he's upset about the damn illegal surveillance in the first place. Said he didn't sign up for this crap. He just wanted to help his friend out. Now he is afraid that he will get into trouble due to the unauthorized investigation and surveillance of the sheriff. I don't know how long I can keep him here, or how long I can keep him silent. Ooh, crap. Give me a minute. I need to talk to Don. We will contact you again. Stay on top of things for now, Slim. After discussing the problem with Don, Mona called Slim back. Slim, let's see if you can keep this in check today and control Terry. Be damn sure you get good notes and bring them to me as soon as the action is over. We, of course, need reliable backups and good hiding places for these recordings. We'll have a meeting Monday night at the Armory to discuss this with the team. We can do this either before or after our meeting. The group stopped monitoring Shirley and Wilson, but continued to collect electronic information from intercepted telephone conversations, as well as from homes and vehicles. Much of this was interesting. Very interesting. Not only were the sheriff and police chief involved, but they also caught the name of the local prosecutor being mentioned. In one of the intercepted phone calls, Wilson said, Shirley, you have to work another insurance tomorrow at 10 a.m. Bullshit, she said. I already gave these bastards their monthly sex. We all agreed that they have me one day a month. That's all. Uh, Shirley, it's not them. Somehow the prosecutor found out about us. Now you have to offer him the same deal, and tomorrow will be his first sex. The sheriff says we make a lot of money defending him, but you need to give the prosecutor some money. Otherwise, his defense won't be enough. The prosecutor also receives another 5% of profits from us. Damn it, Willie. When will this end? A. Now you make me work for free two days a month and we lose 15% of our income. How the hell did you even let this happen, moron? Damn it. It wasn't me, Shirley. You know, I don't like it any more than you do. I thought about just leaving. You know, but I think the sheriff thought about it. He said that if we left, he would put us on the wanted list for trade, sexy service, and a bunch of other crap. This asshole owns us now, Shirley. Just be glad that he allows us to keep what we earn now. Fine? You son of a bitch. I don't know why I even let you talk me into doing this. Do it for a while, you said. You said we'd get rich and we'd be able to blow up this little town. You said we would be rich and live the good life we always dreamed of. Now look at us. I'm trapped being a damn slut and... Hey, there you are, Shirley. You love your job and you know it. Damn it, you yourself came to me asking me to protect you when we were there. It brought us a lot of money there and now it brings us even more. We will somehow get out of here and live with dignity. You'll see. Yes, exactly. You damn well better be right or I'll find some way to make you pay for this. Have you thought about what would happen if they found out about your other business, asshole? Will you have the same protection for this? Wilson almost whispered, Damn it, Shirley. Shut up. They don't know about it, and we should make damn sure they never find out. Even if they let me pay them back for that too, it might piss off some very bad people. Maybe I should cool off with this a little or maybe just stop selling here. Yes, exactly. I'll just keep my other business out of the county. Maybe I'll just take care of it when we're away from here. Or maybe I can find someone to do the work for me here and just supply them with the product. Yes. That's what I'll do. I might not make as much money, but it might be a lot safer and they wouldn't be able to squeeze a profit out of me if I didn't sell, right? Shirley muttered. You stupid fucking asshole, she said louder. Okay, you win again. Shit. Another damn wasted day. Once again, 
Shirley was forced to provide for herself for free. The group discussed their intelligence so far and decided that it had gone too far. The original plan was to obtain information about Shirley and Wilson and then report them to the public before Randy filed for divorce. They then planned to present it to the prosecutor. This would, of course, benefit Randy, because if Shirley had been convicted of a crime, a divorce would have been more beneficial to him. Now that the entire top law enforcement leadership of the county was involved in the mess, they had to reconsider their plans. They even worried about Wilson's other business. All any of them could think about was illegal substances, and if he was involved in this, they sure as hell wanted to get some serious law enforcement involved. In the middle of the meeting, Mona said, Listen, we're in deep shit here. We urgently need to get this up the chain. I think we need to contact the FBI on this matter. I don't know who would have such jurisdiction. Hearing Mona say this, Randy mumbled, Damn, that's just wrong. I want to hurt Willie and Shirley. How will I do this if we call the FBI? Mona looked back at the angry, drunk Randy and looked at him for a moment the way only a first sergeant and a wife could, even if she wasn't his wife. She looked at a slightly more sober Don and then said, Look, Randy, I think we all want you to be able to hurt them a little, but we can't just do something that hurts them and let the officials of our districts leave. Damn it, if they're so unethical that they act like bitches and let Tricky Willie bribe them with some girl for the night, then what are they doing for other criminals? We must get them too. You know as well as I do that they would never have gone after Trickster and Shirley if we had given them the evidence we had. It would be like cutting your own throat. Besides... If we let them know that we have dirt on them, they too can make our lives hell. No, we must go after them too, and perhaps risk the fact that you will have to take less revenge than you want. Well, I don't like it. I want these idiots to hurt as much as I do. They deserve this pain. Don looked around the table before leaning back in his chair. He said, Look, Randy, none of us are lawyers. Heck, none of us have a college degree in more than two years. We have no way of knowing exactly what the outcome of all this will be, but I seem to remember hearing that convicted criminals are much less likely to get a good divorce agreement than those who are squeaky clean. I think you need to see a lawyer before we get too far. I also think that, no matter what else is going on, we need to empty this safe as soon as possible. At first I thought we needed to just use a combo and drain him, but now I think we need to do something even worse to throw her off the scent. Well, of course, we have to take this money. I'll be damned if she can trick me and then walk away with a ton of cash and half of my farm and things. Yes, but if we do this right, we can give you your money back and make it look like someone else took it. Maybe I'm being overly cautious, but I think I have an idea that will give you some legitimate cash to report on your tax return and a way to hide some of her damn money. Randy looked at Don curiously and said, How am I going to do this? Well, look, the price of scrap iron is now quite high. We all have a bunch of old scrap metal on our farm. We all need to come together and take our scrap metal to the landfill for recycling. Larger pieces will need to be cut so we can transport them. We can start at my house, then do the cutting before we get to yours. We all have big trucks, trailers, and torches to cut large machinery into smaller pieces. We can load scrap metal onto our tractors. When we get to your house, the first piece we cut will be the harvester. We'll be sure to cut the combine open so the safe is still hidden pretty well inside. Before we start cutting, we'll open the safe and take almost all the money out of it. We'll leave, say, a couple hundred dollars inside in case it opens when they crush the scrap metal, if they crush it in place. If they don't crush it, and I don't think they will because the processors don't have a crusher on site, you won't lose much. They typically use a magnet and load the scrap into railroad cars and then send it to be melted down. Either way, this is a perfectly acceptable way for you to get most of the money without anyone knowing anything. We just have to make sure we have a day or two to get the job done before Shirley discovers that the harvester is either cut up or missing. When she misses the harvester, she'll be royally angry, but she won't be able to tell you why. She might even suspect that you found the safe, but she won't be able to prove anything. We'll hide the money somewhere else until this all blows over, and then we'll give it back to you. Randy looked around at his friends, sitting at the table. His face broke into a wide smile, and he said, Now that's what I'm talking about. We get money, 
but they have her. He chuckled and said, Hey, it's true, isn't it? She still has it every time, and I did it to her again. I like it. So how do we make Shirley and Willie pay? I still want it to hurt. Mona intervened again, saying, Don, I like your idea for several reasons. We're all getting rid of some clutter in our homes, and boy, do I know how much I love it. I've been tired of all this stuff for quite some time, but I didn't say anything about it because we were so damn busy. We all get some extra income as well, but most importantly, Randy gets a ton of Patsy money for free. So, does anyone know a good divorce lawyer, preferably one who could advise Randy on other issues as well? Then Slim spoke. Yeah, anyway, I might know someone who can help. Do you all remember Paulette from school? He received a few nodes and a few agreements before he continued. He grinned at Randy and said, Don't look at us like that, Randy. I know you remember her. Will you ever recover from the thrashing her old man gave you when he caught you two in the hayloft? Randy's face turned a deep shade of red and he glared at Slim before muttering, Fuck you and that horse you rode on, you moron. After this short exchange, everyone at the table burst out laughing. Mona, like the good first sergeant that she was, brought the meeting back to the topic at hand. She looked at Slim and said, Okay, Slim, stop making fun of Randy and tell us about the lawyer. Well, I don't know any lawyers myself, but I heard that Paulette worked for a whole company in Centerton. She got a job with them when she graduated from college and has been with them ever since. I heard they made her proud when she had to divorce that cheating city dude she was engaged to in college. I think if we called her, she could find us a good friend. Well, I don't have a better idea. Does anyone else know? Okay, who knows her best? And again, loud laughter filled the room as the men looked at Randy. Mona glared at the men and said, Okay, assholes. You know what I meant. Anyone? Nobody said anything, then finally Don said, I think we all know her, honey, but I don't think any of us have seen her since her daddy died. What, seven or eight years ago? Okay, then the choice is... Either Randy's or mine. Does anyone at least know where she works or what her phone number is? And again, there were no answers. Well, that's crap. What should I do? Just start calling lawyers and asking if Paulette works there. Randy looked at Mona and said, Most of her family lives in Steelville. I don't know who it is or where. Her aunt was married to one of the fieldings, and they almost owned the town. You could call there or go to the store they may know. Great. Well, it doesn't compare to anything. Okay, I'll get to it tomorrow. Is there anything else we need to talk about tonight? Don looked around at those sitting at the table and then said, Yes, honey. I think we need to lay low for a while and just continue to passively observe while we do other things. Let's see what the lawyer says before we contact the FBI. Everyone thought the idea was good, and it was accepted. The meeting finally ended after they did a little security work to cover their tracks and make it seem like the use of the armory was completely legal. The next day, Mona drove to Steelville and went to a feed and farm Soupley store. There was only one woman working behind the counter, dispensing purchases, so Mona stood to the side, waiting for her chancy to speak. Soon a woman came out of the office and asked if she could help Mona. I hope so. I'm Mona Terwilliger from Wilson's Mill. I have a strange request. I used to go to school with Paulette Chambers. Last week, a group of friends and I were talking about people we once knew and her name came up. We remembered that some of the fieldings were related to her, and I came to see if I could talk to any of them and get her address or phone number. The woman smiled and said, I'm Jennifer Fielding Scott. Why don't you come into the office so we can talk? I watch phones for my mom while she runs errands. After they sat down in the cluttered office, Jennifer leaned back in her desk chair and frowned at Mona. She said, So why exactly are you looking for Paulette? I'm not going to give out information about her to anyone, just because you want it. Mona sat there for a moment, looking at Jennifer. There was something about her. She was so confident and had such a look in her eyes. She could look into your soul, and she had a long, penetrating look, as if she had been to hell and back. She carried herself with authority and confidence. Mona knew better than to try to flirt with her. She finally decided on a piece of truth and hoped she wouldn't go too far. Why the hell did she come across this woman? Perhaps I misled you a little? 
she said. Last week we were talking about old friends, and Paulette's name really came up. We were holding a training meeting at Orugia and discussing the personal problems of one of my soldiers during a break when Jennifer leaned forward slightly. Her eyes glared at Mona like lasers as she snapped, Were you discussing my cousin in training with your soldiers? Just who the hell are you, Missy? I'm a commander, USN, retired, so you can take this as an order if you want. Now I want to see some ID, and I mean now. Unless you convince me that you mean Paulette no harm, you won't get anything from me. Oh, damn, Mona thought. She looked at Jennifer again and realized it. The I will be obeyed look is a deep-rooted confidence that comes with command and for senior military officers. She had never thought about whether Jennifer could legally give her an order or not. Her immediate reaction was to obey the senior officer, so she rummaged through her purse and found her ID. She leaned forward and handed her ID to Jennifer. Jennifer looked at the ID and handed it back. She said, First Sergeant, right? Well, I guess you're not some stalker or axe murderer anyway. So, First Sergeant, why do you want to find Paulette? Like I said, ma'am, we were in a meeting and her name came up. One of my men is having some problems with his cheating wife. Some of us were helping him get information about her when we learned something that was much, much beyond our expertise. A few years ago, we heard that Paulette was working for a lawyer, so we wanted to talk to her about a divorce lawyer and one who could help with another matter as well. What else is the matter? Ooh, ma'am, I really better not talk. This is truly massive, and many people could get hurt or even killed if we don't handle it properly. God, what the hell have you gotten yourself into here? Okay, never mind. I'll take your word for it right now. Jennifer picked up the phone and dialed the number, after looking it up in the little book she had in her purse. When the call was answered, she said, Hi, Paul. I have someone here who is looking for you. She said she went to school with you and wants to pick her brain about a divorce lawyer and someone who does something else. No, she won't say anything more. Her name is Mona Terwilliger. Okay, let me check. Jennifer looked up from her phone and said, She says they're open tomorrow morning from Oro 9 OR. She remembers you, but I'm still not going to give you her personal number. Do you want to make an appointment? Mona reached for her purse and said, Let me check, please. She called Randy, and he agreed that they would make an appointment. She said, yes, please, Commander. Fine. Yes, Paul. They will be there. So, when are you coming back here to see us? Yeah. Okay. See you. Jennifer hung up and turned her attention back to Mona. She said, okay, tomorrow at 09.00, Fielding and McCullum, Lawyers, Centerton, 2987, S, Primrose Ave, Second Floor, and... First Sergeant, I hope that someday I will know everything about it. Mona smiled and said, Thank you, ma'am, for everything. And if I'm not wrong in my assumptions, you and everyone in the country will hear about it in a few weeks. The next morning, Randy, Don, and Mona arrived at the lawyer's office about ten minutes early. As soon as they entered, a beautiful woman about their age looked up from her computer terminal. She smiled and said, Randy, what a surprise. I see you're still dating Mona and Don T. Nice to see you all. Come in and have a seat. We were only expecting Mona, but I assume you're all together. How about a cup of coffee? Chuck is talking on the phone, but I don't think it will be for long. Paulette had not yet returned with coffee when a well-dressed middle-aged man entered the reception area. He smiled and said, I'm Charles Fielding, Jr. You can call me Chuck. I assume you're all together. Paul told me I should talk about divorce. Which one of you is going to get divorced? Randy raised his hand and said, It must be me, sir. I'm Randall Thomas, but most people call me Randy. At that moment, Paulette came back and giggled. She blushed slightly and said, Yes, you have always been lustful. As far as I remember, we both got in trouble for this. Then Chuck laughed and, holding out his hand to Randy, said, Okay. I know the story. You know Bradley hated you until the day he died. He never forgot what you and Paul did in his hayloft. And then you had the nerve to tell him it was none of his business. So you didn't do anything else like that that led to this divorce, did you? 
Randy blushed and said, No, sir, but could we discuss this somewhere else, please? Chuck looked upset and said, You're absolutely right, and I'm really sorry. This is not a place to discuss the past or what you are here for. My apologies, sir. No problem. I understand, but we really need privacy for this. Chuck turned to Paulette and said, As soon as Betty gets here, come in. No. I don't know why, but I think you better be aware from the beginning. Place the sign on the table and increase the volume of the entrance bell. You can do both jobs until Betty arrives. She should have been here by now. The five of them retired to the conference room, and after some small talk to get to know each other a little, they got down to business. Chuck started by saying, It's okay now, Randy. Please explain your problem to me, and we will see what I can do to help you with this. Randy started telling Chuck about Shirley. He started with her alleged actions in Iraq, then about their marriage and what he overheard that made him suspect her of cheating. He explained how Don and Mona became involved in the case and what they discovered while investigating Shirley and Wilson. When he got to the point where the sheriff's involvement became known, Chuck said, Whoa, are you trying to tell me that the sheriff, police chief, and Potter County prosecutor are taking protection money from Shirley and this Wilson character? Do you have any evidence for your claim? You know, this is a very serious charge. Before we can do anything, we need more than just your word. Randy looked at Mona and she reached for her large bag, saying, Chuck, we know what you're talking about. I have a copy of this recording and several others if you want to listen to them. She handed the DVD to Chuck. He inserted it into his laptop and turned it so everyone could see. After the DVD finished playing, Chuck sat back in his chair, very shocked. He said, I can't believe it. I have known Lawrence since he moved to this area to practice law, long before he was elected prosecutor. I just can't believe he or the sheriff would be involved in something like this. I recommend putting off your divorce for a while, Randy, until authorities complete their own investigation into these allegations. If they can obtain evidence to prosecute your wife, it may help your case. Plus, we could hurt their case against the sheriff, the police chief, and the prosecutor. If we go to court for a divorce now, I can help with your divorce and I can put you in touch with people who can help with others. May I ask what other damaging information you have? After they continued discussing the case, Chuck picked up the phone from the conference table and said, Betty, something pretty serious has happened. Please cancel the rest of my appointments for today and reschedule them for another time. But before you do, please call Mark Howard and ask him to come here as soon as he can. Tell him this is extremely important. The most important thing is what he has at work today. After the phone call, Chuck sat back in his chair and clasped his fingers together, thinking. Paulette put her hand on Randy's forearm and looked into his face. She said, Randy, I'm so sorry. I know how you must feel. A few years ago, I caught my husband cheating and Uncle Chuck helped me divorce him. I can't imagine how much worse you feel knowing that your wife is also an available girl. If you ever need to talk, please call me. The three friends spent almost 1 p.m. discussing the case with Chuck and his friend Mark Howard from the FBI. They were ordered to immediately stop all surveillance of people and take back their cameras and voice recorders if they could do so safely and without letting anyone know they were there. Three months passed before the investigation reached the point where Mark allowed Chuck to file for divorce from Randy. During this time, Slim and Don's farms were cleared of all old broken equipment and scrap iron. They worked slowly in between other more important tasks. Finally, they were given permission to file for divorce, and the friends immediately went to Randy's junk pile to get the cash from the safe before Shirley either tried to take it and run away or something else happened to them. They waited until they were sure she and Wilson were working, and then went to the combine first, just as they had planned many months ago. The night they emptied Shirley's safe, the friends met at Don's house to count the money. They worked for almost two hours before they finished. After Mona tallied the balance, she looked at Randy in shock. She said, Oh my God, Randy, there's almost $500,000 here. If we're not mistaken, it's four hundred and eighty-seven, four hundred dollars how the hell has she been doing this for long, and if she has that much cash, how much more has she received and spent? Has she ever been faithful to you? 
about. I'm sorry, Randy. I shouldn't have said that. No problem, Mona. I've been asking myself the same question ever since we discovered this mess. Now I even wonder if the child she lost right after we got married was even mine. Thank God we never managed to have children. The next afternoon, Slim, Don, and Randy were clearing away scrap metal when Shirley came into the machine room to see what they were doing. She stopped and stared at the spot where the old combine used to be, then almost ran over to Randy. She screamed, Randy, what the hell are you doing? Where is the old combine and other equipment? We all needed some extra money in this damn economy. So since scrap metal sells for a good price, we cleaned out our junk. We've already cleaned Don and Slim's houses and started cleaning ours yesterday. We cut large pieces before taking them to the scrapyard. Why do you ask? Shirley collapsed to the ground crying. Randy looked down at her and said, What's wrong with you, Shirley? For God's sake, it's just a pile of scrap metal. Why are you crying? Where are you going? I really like this combination. This was the first big machine we bought for the farm. You can't just throw it away. Sorry, Shirley. I didn't think you'd be so attached to it. It's just a piece of worn-out metal. Heck, I suspect he's on his way to being melted down by now. They loaded it right onto the train when we brought it in yesterday. Shirley jumped up and slapped Randy, then screamed, You son of a bitch! How could you get rid of our harvester? She ran around the machine shed, and soon they heard the roar of a car in the driveway. Randy looked at his friends and smiled, rubbing his cheek. He said, Well, it went pretty well, didn't it? I wonder where she's going. Everyone present laughed and then went back to work. Later that evening, Shirley was still not home. Around 8.30 p.m., Randy received a call from a very upset Shirley. She was crying and he could barely understand. Her when she said, Randy, honey, I'm in jail in Centerton. Could you please come and pay my deposit so I can go home? Should I pay bail? What the hell have you done, Shirley? And what is the deposit? Bail is $10,000. I was arrested for exposing myself to public ridicule and not leaving private property when ordered. Uh, they also said I was resisting arrest. What the hell? What were you doing? Nothing. This is all just a misunderstanding. Please hurry up. He heard the phone hang up. Randy laughed to himself for a moment, then called the Centerton Police Department to find out why Shirley had been arrested. The officer Randy spoke to reviewed the complaint and told him that she was at the salvage yard, running around stacks of metal and yelling about her harvester. She refused to leave when ordered, so she was arrested. She was charged with trespassing, disorderly conduct, and resisting arrest. Randy laughed again, and after the conversation ended, he dialed Paulette's cell phone number. After she answered, he paused for a moment and then said, Tell Paulette. If the papers are ready to be filed, can Chuck file them tomorrow? Shirley is being held in the Centerton City Jail on $10,000 bail, which I have no intention of paying. I think now is a good time to let her know, don't you? The arrests came fast and furious the next day. A federal task force picked up the county sheriff, police chief, prosecutor, and a half dozen other senior law enforcement officials at about 6 a.m. A little later that day, Wilson was arrested along with his lady friend. Of course, the charges were added to those Shirley was already facing and her bail was increased. Not that it mattered since no one even paid the initial deposit. Mid-afternoon on a day when the hammer had fallen for many local law enforcement officials, Randy received a phone call. When he picked up the phone, he heard, Randy? This is Paulette. Mr. Fielding would like me to call you and set up a meeting to discuss your situation in more detail. Could you come tomorrow or the day after tomorrow? Yes, any day suits me. What time should I be there? When Randy walked into the law firm's reception area, this time there was a secretary in the reception area instead of Paulette. She announced it, and a smiling Paulette left the office. She ran up to Randy and hugged him in greeting and then said, Randy, good to see you again. Come on, please. Today we are in Mr. Fielding's office. Would you like some coffee or something else to drink before we start? No, I'm fine. Thank you. After greetings and a long chat with Chuck and Paulette to maintain social decorum, Chuck sat back in his chair. He said, Randy, I understand it was quite busy in Potter County yesterday. 
None of your friends got splashed when that shit hit the fan, did they? No, sir. As far as I know, nothing happened to anyone I care about. However, I know that my wife and an old high school acquaintance did not seem very happy with the outcome of the day. Why do you ask? Well, since you brought it up, I wanted to talk about your wife and her friend Wilson. We can file for divorce and serve it right now if you want, but I advise you to wait. If she is found guilty of almost any of the charges brought against her, the divorce will go much better for you. I am proposing a legal separation now, followed by a divorce if and when she is convicted. Well, I do not know. Lawyers cost money, you know. Everyone laughed at that before Randy could continue. As far as I understand, if we are married, I am legally responsible for her bills. We're in a tough spot right now, and I really can't let her do anything that would drain the bank accounts even more. I understand, but with legal separation, we can control this problem. We file for divorce and make announcements. We put a note in the newspaper and so on, letting everyone know that you have separated and are no longer responsible for her debts. Okay, if this works, I suppose I could wait for the real divorce. Could you tell me what I can expect if we go this route? For some time, they discussed the possible consequences of various courses of action, and Randy decided to postpone the divorce. As they left the meeting, Randy's stomach growled. He saw that it was almost 12.30 and turned to Paulette. He said, Paulette, would you like to have lunch with me? I skipped breakfast this morning and I'm starving. Paulette smiled and said, Yes, I think I would really like that. To his slight surprise, the dinner went wonderfully. It was as if the previous almost 18 years had never happened. They laughed and talked, reminisced and looked soulfully into each other's eyes. Before the snack was finished, Paulette would hold hands with Randy or touch his forearm to emphasize points in the conversation. Suddenly, Paulette noticed a clock on the wall and straightened up. Oh no, she said. It's almost two o'clock in the afternoon. I am late. Chuck will kill me. Come on, hurry up. I have to get back to work. Randy thought slowly. He was accustomed to spending as much time as he wanted on most of his tasks, unless he was at a guard meeting or had to plant or harvest crops. He was a little puzzled for a moment, but then it dawned on him. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry, Paul. Went. On the way out, Randy caught their waitress and informed her of the rush. She took his credit card and paid the bill as quickly as she could, while Paulette shifted impatiently from foot to foot. When they returned to the office, Betty, the receptionist, smiled at a panicked Paulette as she ran through the door, Randy following behind her. She said, You're a little late, aren't you, Paulette? Mr. Fielding just asked me if I thought we should send a search party after you. You weren't kidnapped or anything, were you? No, nothing like this. I just lost track of time. I'll contact Mr. Fielding and let him know I'm back. I'm sorry I interrupted your lunch break. Paulette rushed down the corridor to Mr. Fielding's office. She didn't notice that Randy had followed her. She knocked on the door and stuck her head in, then said, Sorry, I got back late from lunch, sir. Randy and I were talking, and I lost track of time. I'll stay late tonight to catch up. Before Chuck could respond... Randy gently pushed Paulette aside and entered the office. He said, No, Paulette. This time, you don't take the brunt of the blame. Look, Mr. Fielding, it's my fault that Paulette came back late. I'm afraid I stayed longer at lunch than I should have and didn't pay enough attention to my watch. Just bill me for our wasted time and leave her alone, please. You know, Mr. Thomas, Randy, when I mentioned meeting you and your friends a couple of weekends ago... Some of the family warned me that I should watch out for you and keep away from Paulette. I take it this isn't the first time you two have gotten into trouble together, is it? Randy's face tensed, and he opened his mouth to say something. He felt Paulette's hand on his shoulder and looked down at her just as Chuck continued talking. I'm sorry, Randy. I shouldn't have said that. I wanted to joke, but I understand that it was a bad joke. As for returning late... Don't worry about it. My understanding is that she was having lunch with a client and it was a necessary business meeting. Now you two, relax. We will keep you updated on the outcome of your case. All cases moved slowly through the court system. 
Finally, after almost three months, Shirley's case was concluded. She was convicted of trafficking her body, trespassing, and resisting arrest. She was sentenced to six months in prison, but received credit for time served while awaiting trial. The remainder of her sentence was suspended and placed on probation for two years. She was acquitted of charges related to the trafficking of Dodger Willie's heroin. The day after the verdict, Shirley was served with divorce papers and the case began to work its way through the court system. The case finally went to hearing. About the only asset the couple had to divide was their farm, and they had minimal equity in it. Sure, there were bank accounts and vehicles, but they weren't worth much. After hearing the case, the judge made her decision. Things could have been worse for Randy, much worse. The farm was only marginally profitable, bringing them about $2,000 a month. Their home equity in the land was only 53746 the judge ordered Randy to pay Shirley alimony of $500 per month for two years and awarded her 20% of the value of the farm property. Shirley was about to be charged with contempt of court when she screamed, What? This is unfair. I should get half and he should pay me more per month to live on. What about my money? I mean, I think he has more money than he said. Mrs. Thomas, are you saying that there are resources not mentioned in the documents submitted to this court? Do you have evidence that there are other resources not included in the list? Uh, no, Your Honor. I just mean that I, uh, we should have more money. He cleaned up the trash in the engine yard, and I think there was more money there than he said. The judge leafed through the papers in front of her and stopped at the end. She read for a while, then said, I see here that this year's income reported to date includes the sale of scrap to a recycling company. I show that the money was transferred to your joint account. I see no reason to continue questioning the financials, Mrs. Thomas. As I stated previously, Mr. Thomas was granted a divorce on the grounds of adultery and the property division remains as I stated. The court session is declared closed. Shirley cried as Randy and his lawyer walked past her chair to leave the room. She glared at Randy and hissed, You're an asshole! I think you're deceiving me. You stole my money, idiot. Chuck stood next to Shirley and her lawyer and said, We'll take out a loan against the farm for the agreed amount and send you a cashier's check within a week. I assume you will allow us to send lump sum support payments as well. As Chuck and Randy walked out of the courtroom, they were greeted by a smiling Paulette. She stepped towards Randy and quickly hugged him. She stepped back and said, Congratulations, Randy. You got a much better settlement than you would have gotten without the convictions. Do you have any plans now? Yes. I go home and try to forget this shit. I think I'll continue farming. Don said he would lend me money to pay her off so I could get rid of her for good. Otherwise, no, just keep going like this. Over the next few months, life returned to normal for the three friends. They actually met more often either in the mornings in a cafe or in the evenings on weekends at a local bar. Most of the time, they spent at least a few minutes discussing the biggest news stories of the year, the arrests and prosecutions of county and local law enforcement officers. They also discussed special elections held to replace the sheriff and prosecutor after they were convicted of their crimes. They were very happy that Terry was elected sheriff. The fame he received when it was revealed that he was involved in the initial investigation and discovery of his boss's criminal activities served him well. One morning the friends were sitting in a cafe, solving the world's problems and drinking their morning elixir, when the door opened and slammed again. This happened so often that most clients never noticed it, there was the sound of light footsteps approaching, and Randy jumped. Someone's small female hands grabbed him by the shoulders and pressed him to her. He smelled the most divine aroma as strands of blonde hair tickled his ear. He heard a melodious voice say, Well, look at the hard-working farmer growing all these crops to feed the hungry city dwellers. His arms left his torso, and he turned to see a beautiful, healthy apparition standing next to him and slightly behind him grinning on his shocked face. He jumped to his feet and said, Paulette, what are you doing here? Sit down and have coffee with us. 
Shortly after Pauletti arrived, Don and Mona left to go back to work. Sleem followed them about 15 minutes later. Randy and Pauletta continued to chat. Time flew by, just as it did in the city when they dined together three times. Finally, around half past ten, Randy said, Listen, Paulette, I'm sorry. I really need to go home today and do something. Are you staying with us for a long time? Could we maybe meet up tonight or something? We could grab a burger somewhere and maybe go to Dottie's for a beer if you want to. I'm on vacation for two weeks, Randy. I'm spending this week here with my mom to celebrate the 4th, and next week I'm just going to go for a drive and see the country before I go back to work. What are you going to do today? Maybe I could help. Uh, I don't actually do much. I just need to finish work on my planter to get it ready for planting my second crop of soybeans. I need to change the plates, lubricate them, and then once that's done, I'll work on the combine to get it ready to roll. Heck, if you want, you can come and we can be together while I work on this. I like to have everything ready to go before the 4th of July. It would be great. I really enjoy my job, but sometimes I really miss the farm. I used to enjoy working with my dad when he did field work. I miss some of the animals too, but not the hard, dirty work of castrating and processing cattle. And I never want to milk another cow. Heck, I even enjoyed bottle feeding the calves when we picked them up from mom to milk them. Perhaps you could come to your mother on the 4th? The family always has a big party. We go to Fielding's Resort, grill, and eat and drink too much. We always swim, and some of the guys fish or play golf. Damn it, why am I telling you all this? You probably remember what we did when we were dating. I know everyone would love to see you again. Uh, I don't know. I remember a couple of them wanted to kick my ass for a while. Paulette laughed and her eyes sparkled as she replied, Well, yeah, but they got over it. I'm sure Mom would be glad to see you again. She always said that you were the best boy that ever came to us, and she included my brother's friends among them. Then it's a date. Besides Thanksgiving and Christmas, the 4th of July is my favorite holiday. Shirley and I always took at least a day off and headed to the river to camp and barbecue with our friends. Paulette noticed the moisture in the corners of Randy's eyes as he first choked and then clenched his jaw in anger, remembering what his now ex-wife had done throughout their marriage. She gently placed her hand on his shoulder and said, I know. The wound is still fresh. It will take some time to heal, but trust me, it will heal. However, you will never forget, and this makes it much harder to trust again. Randy and Paulette each drove their own car to Randy's farm. He waited until she got out of the car, then invited her inside to look at the house when she mentioned how nice the yard and exterior were. After a brief tour, Randy said, I really need to get to work, Paul. He went to the refrigerator and got himself a beer. Over his shoulder, he said, I'm drinking beer. Want? Paulette smiled and said, Of course. It had been a long time since I had eaten this early. Remember those times when we went canoeing and we had a relationship? Sometimes we would finish our second or third beer by ten in the morning. Yes, those were the good old days. Randy looked at her with regret and continued talking. We certainly had our fun last summer before. Paulette laughed and said, Yes, sometimes I regret that I didn't ignore Dad and break up with you. By the time I decided I was a big girl and had the courage to go against his wishes, you and the other guys had already moved on to basic training and advanced individual training. I was in college when you all came back, and I fell under the spell of your ass. Paulette sat and chatted with Randy while he worked for the first few minutes. Soon she was already acting as his assistant, bringing, carrying, and helping as best she could. All day they worked, talked, and joked. About half past two in the afternoon, Randy's stomach began to growl loudly. He stood up and said, I have to go and get something to eat. Please come and have lunch with me. All we'll have is a sandwich and chips, but if you behave, I'll have another beer with you to wash it down. Paulette smiled and said, Of course, if it doesn't bother you too much. After grabbing a quick sandwich, the couple returned to the machine room and got back to work. Randy stopped around 4.30 p.m. and cleaned the oil and grime off his palms with store-bought liquid. 
he turned to Paulette and said, Well, those two matters are over. Why don't we clean up and run to the bar for dinner? Sounds funny, although I'll have to run home and clean myself up. I feel pretty dirty and know I must smell terrible. I really enjoyed today, though. Thank you for putting up with me. No problem. You helped me a lot, and it was really nice to see you again. What do you say if I pick you up around six? Fine. I'll be ready. It was almost three in the morning when Randy dropped Paulette off his truck at her mother's house. He walked her to the door, and before she entered, he hugged her and kissed her tenderly. He stepped back about two feet and said, I had a lot of fun tonight, Paul. Thank you for coming with me. Paulette stepped towards Randy, gently placed her hand on his chest and looked up at him with shining eyes. She smiled and, standing on tiptoes, quickly kissed him again. I can't remember when I've enjoyed going out with someone as much as I did tonight. Thank you for inviting me. She stepped back and turned slightly to put her hand on the doorknob, then looked back at Randy before stepping inside. Randy slowly walked back to his truck and made the short drive to his house. He and Paulette had dinner, then went to a club where they listened to country music from a popular local band and danced the night away. After leaving the club, they stopped for breakfast at a late-night diner before heading back to Wilson's Mill. Randy walked into his house and began to undress, heading to his bedroom. He rushed into the shower to wash off the cigarette smoke, then headed to bed, where he quickly fell into a dreamless sleep. It was almost ten in the morning when he woke up. While his morning coffee was brewing, Randy did his morning chores, fed the chickens, collected eggs, fed the dog, and enjoyed the moment a little. When he was done, he poured himself his first cup of coffee and sat down on the covered patio to drink it. He pulled his phone out of his pocket and called Paulette. When Paulette hesitantly answered the phone, Randy grinned and said, Good morning, beautiful. I was sitting here with my first cup of coffee and wanted to call and thank you again for last night. They talked for a while, and Randy said, I have to go, honey. I need to get something done today or I'll really fall behind. Fine. Bye. Just before interrupting the conversation, Randy shouted, Hey, wait! What time should I pick you up for the barbecue on Thursday? Oh, uh, I don't know. You remember people start showing up in the middle of the morning, say around 9.30? We can make a whole day out of this. Okay, see you then. Randy felt strange as he and Paulette walked into the clearing where the family meeting was taking place. He knew almost everyone there, except for the spouses who came from out of town, and he even knew some of them because he had seen them in the city with his companion. For the first few minutes, Paulette led him around the room, either introducing him to those he didn't know or standing proudly next to him as he greeted those he did know. After making sure he was settled, Paulette left Randy with some of their mutual friends and headed over to where the women were working, setting out food, plates, and so on. On the way, she passed the grill area and hugged her older brother, Bradley. He hugged her back, looked at Randy, and then raised his eyebrows. He said, You look like the cat that caught the canary, little sister. Do you want to talk about it? Are you sure this is a good idea? No. Yes. Oh my gosh. I don't know. It's almost as if we had never been apart. He makes me laugh. It's been so long since I've had this good, Brad. I missed him so much when Dad sent him away, but I was afraid to go against his will. Now I feel like I, we, have been given a second chance. I want this to work out so badly, but we are completely different people than those two children who were caught in the hayloft that night. You need to be careful, sis. Don't rush into it because you remember or think you remember, loving him when you were in high school. I think he's a good person, but you remember how hard it was for us growing up. Farming is hard work, and he is a farmer. You are used to an easy life in the city. Are you sure you want to chase him? I... I think so. We're just communicating, you know? But it's too early for our second time. We had several long lunches during his divorce, and we only went on two real dates. I spent last Saturday helping him work on his equipment before we went out, and it was fun. It might be fun for one day, sis, but is that what you want to do for the rest of your life? I thought you were itching to get off the farm when you went to college.
I did so. Well, no, not really. I wanted to get away from Dad and those damn cash cows. I never minded the idea of being a grain or beef farmer's wife, but I hated helping milk the milk. We never got to go on vacation or anything like that. We had to be home twice a day to milk those damn cows. We started at 6.30 in the morning and, if we were lucky, finished by 7 or 8 in the evening. To his surprise, Randy had a great time at the barbecue. After eating, he and Paulette walked a few meters upstream to the swimming area, swam, talked, and had a few beers with a few of their old school friends. It's time to help clean up and head home long before it's ready. For the rest of the summer, Randy and Paulette talked on the phone almost every evening. They usually had at least one date a week, sometimes two, unless Randy was too busy at the farm. In this case, Paulette was usually able to get to his house to either see him there at the end of the day, or she would meet him in the field for a quick lunch or ride with him on equipment if there was a safe place to do so. She especially liked riding the combine with him. The cabin was large enough to accommodate an extra seat, and the cabin had air conditioning. A couple of times she even drove his grain truck to the grain elevator during harvest. It was like old times for her. While she was waiting for her turn to unload, she talked to other people who were unloading there. Finally, the harvest was completed, and Randy planted winter wheat. He was able to slow down and work shorter days again. He was invited to the Paulette family's home for Thanksgiving. It was a beautiful autumn day. The temperature was about 15 degrees, so after dinner she and Paulette went to the back of her mother's small farm, sat by the river and talked. Randy seemed quieter and more reserved than usual. Finally, Paulette looked at him and asked, Is something wrong, Randy? You were terribly silent today. No, honey. I was just thinking about us. For some reason, Paulette felt a wave of fear run through her body. She asked worriedly, What do you mean? Is there some problem? I don't know. No, I mean, well, I really enjoyed the summer after my divorce and when we were together, but I don't want it to continue like that. Paulette felt a wave of fear wash over her again. She started to ask what he meant when Randy continued. I wondered what it would have been like if things had turned out differently when we left school. I feel so good when I'm with you that I almost get angry again, thinking about all the years we missed. I don't want to miss anything anymore, Paulette. Randy turned to the puzzled young woman and took her hand, then continued to say, I'm getting tired of seeing you only once or twice a week and answering the phone for a few minutes every night. I've been trying to think of the best way to ask you to marry me, but I just can't think of any particular way to do it. Paulette gasped when she heard Randy say he wanted to marry her. Her eyes filled with tears and her voice trembled as she asked, Did you just ask me to marry you? Randy reached into his pocket and pulled out a ring. He handed it to her and gave her a sick smile before saying, Yeah, I guess I did. Pretty unconvincing, isn't it? But I really love you. I think I've always loved you. And getting to know you again this spring and summer has only made me realize how much. So what do you say? You will do this? Paulette smiled and reached for the ring, saying, Yeah, that was pretty lame, but that's okay. Yes, I will marry you. She put the ring on, and they did what young people do when they are in love. They kissed and sealed the deal as their hearts grew even closer. After a few kisses and strong caresses, Paulette pushed away from Randy and straightened her clothes. She smiled and stood up, then extended her hand to help Randy up. She said, Come on, I want to get back to the house before they leave. Show everyone my ring and tell them the news. After some serious discussion, Paulette decided to set the wedding date for the July 4th weekend of the following year so that her extended family could attend. She and Randy started living together on his farm just before Christmas. She found... She enjoyed living in the country again, and had no regrets when she handed in her resignation that spring to prepare for her wedding and help her new man on the farm. The week of the 4th of July held a special place in their hearts, for several reasons. It was not only their nation's birthday, but also the week they lost each other in their youth. She and Randy were caught making love on the 4th of July after they graduated from high school, 
and her father kicked Randy out and forbade them to see each other again. They started their new relationship the week of July 4th, so it was only fitting that they got married then. Up until the day they died, the 4th of July held special meaning for this couple. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.